Hey, Sonia, can we do a uh, sound check and Rebecca? Can you hear me? Hi, Peter. Yes, we can. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? How's everyone? We're hanging in there. All right, Rebecca Sharp. Hello. Okay, great. Perfect. And just for the good of the order, we are currently live on YouTube. Hey, Greg, we're doing a sound check. Hi, Sue, we're doing everybody. a sound check. Hi there, how are you? Good, okay, John Brett. How are you all? I'm here. Great. Do you see us on YouTube by chance? Hi, Elizabeth. Can we do a sound check with you? Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Great. Yep. Sure can. Okay. Then you're on YouTube. Thank you. Hey, Phil, just doing a quick sound check. I'm here. Great, thank you.
we'll get started in a minute. We're just waiting for one more member. Mr. Henderson, we are just doing a sound check. Can we make sure that you're there and can hear us and we can hear you? Hi, hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Can't see you, but we can hear you. Let me access my camera. There we go. There we go. Now we got you both ways. Thank you. Okay. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to call this May 11th, 2021, Electronic Hybrid School Board Meeting to Order. Ms. Goodell, can you call the roll? Uh, yes, Dr. Anderson? Here. Dr. Dimmick? Here. Ms. Downs? Here. Ms. Mr. Henderson? I think you're muted. Ms. There we go. Oh, thank you. Ms. Litton? Here. Mr. Reitinger? Here. And Dr. Ruiz Balanas? Here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Cadell. Um, could I have everybody join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Um, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, do we have a second? Second. second. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Yes, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right, we will now begin with public comment and request. Um, before I start, I need to read the statement on electronic participation. While in the state of emergency remains in effect due to COVID-19, written statements for public comment may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to school board members. Please send written statements to school board clerk Marty Goodell at goodellm at fccps.org. Public comments received by 10 a.m. on the day of the meeting will be posted on board docs prior to the meeting. Individuals wishing to make public comments virtually may do, must register in advance by emailing school board clerk Marty Goodell at goodellm at fccps.org with their name, address, contact information, and topic no later than 5 p.m. the day prior to the meeting. Individuals who indicate they wish to speak will receive an email with a speaker number and information to access the meeting. Individuals will speak in the order of their speaker number in accordance with school board policy BDDH. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Ms. Goodell, do we have any speakers this evening? Uh, no, we do not have any speakers. All right, we do not have any speakers. And did we have any written comments? We did receive, the school board received one comment about the school renaming and it's on board docs. Great, thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right, since we do not have public comments, we will now go on to our budget public hearing. Um, I again need to read a statement on electronic participation before we begin this section. Individuals wish wishing to participate in the budget public hearing number three via Zoom must register in advance by email emailing school board clerk Marty Goodell at goodellm at fccps.org with their name, address, and contact information no later than 5 p.m. the day prior to the meeting. Individuals who indicate they wish to speak will receive an email with a speaker number and information to access the meeting. 
individuals will speak in the order of their speaker number in accordance with school board policy BDDH. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Ms. Goodell, do we have any speakers for the uh, budget hearing? No, no speakers signed up. All right. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right, we will now move to our closed meeting. Is there a motion to move to closed? Uh, Dr. Anderson. Chair Lytton, pursuant uh, to the Virginia Freedom Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Personnel under section 2.2-3711A1, in particular staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignations, staff retirements, staff performance, staff change in position, staff termination, dependent care leave, long-term medical leave, child care leave requests and leave of absence, unpaid leave requests, advisory committee appointments and student matters under section 2.2-3711A1, in particular, a tuition waiver request per policy 9.21, non-resident student admission and tuition, section three anticipated residents, and a non-resident tuition student request and legal matters under section 2.2-3711A7, in particular, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Yes. Um, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, so we um, have a, we now have a closed session. There will be, or there is a link that's been sent to everybody. So if you'll log out of this one and log into the new link, uh, that would be great. And um, the three of us, four of us can retreat maybe to another room and then we'll log into a computer there. See you in a minute.
Sonia, can you hear us? Yes, okay. I was just commenting on how fast you are getting back to this meeting. <laughs> I had to walk a long way. <laughs> Gotta re readmit everybody. Whenever you're ready. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, can I get a motion to reconvene? Uh, Chair, I move that we reconvene to open meeting. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Can we get a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Henderson. Ms. Goodell. Uh, yes. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reichter? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right. Now, um, can I get a motion to certify the meeting? Uh, Dr. Dimmick. Whereas the Falls Church City School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Can we get a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ruiz Bolanos. Ms. Goodell. Uh, yes, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reichter? Yes. Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right. We will move on to recognitions and reports. And we are excited to get to this one. Um, we are going to do some well-deserved recognition of our superintendent. Um, just as background uh, to let everybody know, this year, instead of choosing one um, VAS, which is the Superintendents Association, their board of directors usually chooses a superintendent of the year. But this year, due to the year we've had, um, they decided that all of the superintendents across the state deserve to be the superintendent of the year. <laughs> but I, I just have to say that I think for us, um, we think Dr. Noonan deserves to be superintendent of the year, even if there were only one, because this has really, really been an amazing year. And we are really, really thankful for all the amazing work you've done. Um, you are truly outstanding at your job and we are super thankful you are here and we think you deserve all kinds of recognition. Um, I guess I just wanted to point out three things. I think I personally, and I think the board shares this, I'm, I'm especially grateful for your work on. Um, first and foremost is of course, just leading us through the pandemic. Um, I think you can, I would guess you would say you, you haven't had a year like this before. Um, it's been extremely difficult and I think you've been extremely measured and you know, strong in your leadership through this. You are always 
um, trying to keep data and the information we had in front of us um, as a guide and putting the safety of students and community first. And we're really thankful for your leadership on that because I know I know it's been hard. So so thank you for that. Second, I want to say thank you for getting the new high school built. We know that that was an incredible task, an incredible feat that, that it is completed on time and on budget. And, you know, I think in the midst of this year, it's almost gotten a little bit overlooked, but I think that is honestly an incredible thing you've accomplished and you really have led the way on that. Um, and it's it's an amazing job you've done. So, you know, and, and we know you're doing that in addition to all the other stuff you do. So thank you. And then finally, I just wanna say thank you for your leadership on, on our work kind of around equity and just making sure we are a district that is welcoming to everybody. Um, you know, I think you've really done great work on helping to lead us in that area um, to value every student, which I think we all 100% support and, and we really appreciate all the work you've, you've done on that. Um, so with that, I do just want to open it up. I, I don't expect that everybody wants to make a whole nother speech, but <laughs> if there is anything you'd like to quickly say, we can do that. Or you don't you don't need to if you feel it is then <laughs> Dr. Dimick. I just want to say a big thank you. Um, there were times during this pandemic when I thought, oh my goodness, you just have the the most difficult job of all of us managing so many different moving parts when everyone, you know, there are many strong opinions in our community and um, frequently on opposite sides of each other. And, and yet you've been able to balance things and see us through. And um, I'm grateful for your leadership. Thank you. Chair Litton. I would, Thanks, I would, yes, I would like to congratulate and thank Dr. Noonan of, you know, when Sue and I ran for, and, and Phil ran for re-election, but when we ran for uh, school board during that time, everyone talked about the high school. How are you going to, you know, make sure that that high school is built on time and on budget and on, on, on. And, you know, the pandemic made the high school sort of an afterthought, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable that, you know, it's kind of like, okay, it's on time, it's on budget, great, but we got the schools back open. So I just think it's such a testament to you, such, you know, congratulations getting that building on time, on budget. We got the kids moved in right when you said, all while a pandemic was going on. So just thank you for that. Um, we are just grateful for your leadership. Great. All right. So now we have a, a, a motion to. Oh, Chair, sorry. Chair so, Lytton, I think Mr. Reininger would like to say something. Uh, sorry, Mr. Reininger, I missed that. Go ahead. No worries, Chair Lytton. I, I, you know, I, I, I think um, the prior speakers have, have pretty much covered it all. Um, but as sort of the, I'd say the longest tenured board member uh, right now, uh, as Chair Lytton said, um, I, th I think it's it's appropriate that we recognize that the last year was a really, really, really hard year. Um, the hardest of my six odd years on the board. And I think it's been, um, it's been tough on the parents. It's been tough on the students. Um, it's been tough on the board, um, but most particularly it's been hard on the staff and it's been hard on the administration and it's been hard on you, Dr. Newman. And so I'd like to offer my personal thanks for your steady hand in trying to take care of everyone as best you and we can during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Dr. Anderson. Uh, one of the advantages of following eloquent people is I just get to go, I agree, I agree, I agree. Picking up on the metaphor that uh, Mr. Reitinger was, was driving at, people often say we're all in this together. That seems to have evolved into we're all in the same storm. We're all in different boats, but we're all in the same storm. And I'll take that metaphor and say, Dr. Noonan, um, I had the opportunity to, to observe you uh, working through being the captain of this particular ship through one hell of a storm last year, a little closer as chair perhaps than others, but 
I will just say, yes, I agree with what everyone has said. We are um, very fortunate to have had you at the, at the helm of our ship at that particular bad storm. This is a year like nobody has ever really experienced before. And to get everything done that, that is done and navigate through that storm, thank you. We're, we're very grateful and very fortunate. And, you know, it's been tough for everybody, as Mr. Reitinger said, um, but most particularly, I know that the weight has fallen very hard on your shoulders, and thank you. Well, I, can I just say something? I, I just, I just want to say um, first, thanks, thanks to all of you for this really kind recognition. Um, I would be uh, disingenuous if I, if I said it was me that did all the work. Um, I've got a team here of people that I get to be a part of every day that um, that work really well together, that sort of all pull in the same direction, all have the same goals, all have the same values, all have the same beliefs. And it's all about kids and, and working with, with students to ensure that they're highly successful. So um, while I'm, I'm a member of the team and, and a, a representative, I, I appreciate the, the kindness, but I also would like to share this with the team because they really um, have, have really made made this what it is. So um, it has been a challenging year. Um, I'll save my comments for my year in review, maybe that I'm going to do in a few minutes. Um, but I but I but I also want to thank the board because I, I do recognize, as I read the literature that's coming out about, you know, relationships and and um, how things have gone down. Um, it has been hard on superintendents, but it's been hard on boards too. And I know you have taken a lot of heat, um, but you've always supported us. And, um, and it's because of that support that we're able to be successful. So I also thank you for, for being part of the team. Thanks. Great, thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, we do have a resolution here and I'm actually not gonna read it word for <laughs> word, <laughs> but I'm hoping um, I can get a member to, um, to put the motion forward uh, on this resolution that we could then adopt it. All right, go ahead, Vice Chair Dance. Chair Litton, I move that the school board approve and adopt the Virginia Association of School Superintendents and the Virginia School Boards Association resolution for Dr. Peter Noonan as Superintendent of the Year for 2020 2021 school year in recognition of his leadership and service to Falls Church City Public Schools. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Sorry, I just have to clarify. Is this something we'd actually we'd vote on? Okay. Can I get a second? Go ahead. Dr. Anderson. Second. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. And it passes. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. Thank and you all. Can we possibly get a picture of Dr. Newton? Where are we? All right, we will move on to the consent agenda. Um, do, do we have any questions on this before we get a motion to approve the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, can I get a motion on the consent agenda? I move that the school board approve the consent agenda as presented. 
Thank you. Can I get a second? Uh, Ms. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. All right, Dr. I mean, sorry, Ms. Goodell. <laughs> Dr. Goodell. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimish? Yes. Ms. Down? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Luis Golana? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right, we will move on to section eight, which is our business action and information. Um, and the first three items are on adopting the budget. And I believe I will turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Dr. Anderson? Yes, Sherilyn, I, it, before we get to the budget, I do need to read, a, read my disclosure. And sorry oh, yeah. to interrupt. Oh, no problem, go ahead. Okay, thanks. I have, have it queued up here. Um, I have consulted with the school board attorney and in making the following disclosure of interest pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3112B1, pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3115H, I have a personal interest in the school board budget in that my spouse is an employee of the Falls Church City School Board and I am a member of a group of individuals which are affected by budget decisions. I am able to participate in the transaction fairly, objectively, and in the public interest. Great, thank you, Dr. Anderson. All right, now I will turn it over to Dr. Newman. All right, thank you, Chair Litton. Um, I, I, <laughs> I just realized there's balloons behind me. Thank you for the balloons too. I feel <laughs> very special. Um, I, the one thing you can't tell in, in the era of COVID, I think more than anything else is that as you all were talking, I was smiling from ear to ear. And, and really um, just one more time, just wanna say how much I appreciate um, the support of the board and the support of the team. And just again, say that, you know, it really is a, a collective effort uh, on behalf of our schools. So tonight represents another one of those collective efforts. Um, and it's really around the budget. And um, in the past, um, several months uh, through the good work of our staff and the good work of the board, um, we have been able to move through um, a budget process that began all the way back in December to get us to the approved budget this evening. And um, rather than go through the entire presentation of the approved budget, which we have done in the past, um, well, we did a couple of years ago, we haven't done it for a while. Um, I thought I would just, just give a brief overview of the budget since we've, we've talked about it so many times. Um, it is online, so if anybody would in the public would like to take a look at it, we've held now three different public hearings about it um, and the like. But tonight's, tonight's budget, um, really in my estimation, is a celebration. And it's a celebration in some ways that is um, a marker of a change, a marker of a change in time. Um, I think back to where we were this time last year when we were cutting hundreds of thousands of dollars out of our budget and not being able to provide any compensation for our staff, not having any growth positions, um, not being able to take care of those that take care of our, uh, that take care of us. And um, as, as we move forward with the budget, move through forward and through the budget this year, um, we've been able to accomplish some things that um, were, were a long time coming. And it does, I think, in many ways, representing a turn, represent a turning point in, uh, in the COVID crisis that we've been in um, and allows us to move forward. So uh, before I say any more, I do want to spend just a second thanking a couple of people for their extraordinary, extraordinary work on the budget. The first is to our budget director, Michelle Kopik, who I'm sure is at home watching um, right now. Michelle worked tirelessly, um, many long nights putting together and pulling information um, making sure every decimal point was in the right place to make sure that the budget was done right. And all of that was in combination with our chief operating officer, Kristen Michael. Um, Kristen's leadership around this budget um, and all of our budgets in the past has been um, second to none. She has uh, always done a really tremendous job of keeping us informed in ways that are easily accessible, understandable, always available for questions. Uh, and the like. And, I, and I'd also like to thank everyone else who was involved in the budget process. As I said, it goes back to December. 
Um, we had conversations with school personnel. We had conversations with principals. We had conversations with directors. We had community meetings and the like, and, and here we are. Um, another celebration in this budget is that this is the third year in a row that we have come in in guidance from the city council. Um, that has been a challenge for us. Um, certainly the first year it was a challenge, but we were able to do it. Last year, sort of a wash. Um, we, did, we were coming in at budget, but then or coming in at guidance and, and then everything changed. But this year, even bouncing out of the COVID crisis, as we move ahead, we were able to come in at guidance at two and a half percent and really trying to be as honest brokers um, of that revenue sharing agreement, although not ratified as possible and still being able to provide for a needs-based budget for the school system. And in this budget, um, the celebration for us is that we are able to take care of our staff and our faculty. And so this year, our staff and faculty are getting a well-deserved uh, increase in compensation. Everyone who's eligible for a step increase will get their step increase. And we've also been able to carve out one and a half percent of a cost of living adjustment, um, which not only helps all of our employees, but in many ways it helps us grow the salary scales, which ultimately will have an impact in our ability, hopefully to uh, continue recruiting um, staff. We remain competitive in the region um, and we have really great benefits as well. Um, in addition to the salary piece for our staff, we're also able to do some growth positions this year as we come out of COVID um, that we know are gonna be really important as we head into this coming year. Um, the first is a new counseling position. And we know that there are gonna be students that have some greater needs. And so being able to provide for more counseling services for our kids to maintain our ratios um, at, as low as possible are really important. Uh, we also have included a social work position so that students and families that need extra time or extra support and resources have those opportunities to get those resources uh, whenever necessary. We've included in the budget a new reading and language arts division position because we knew that students coming out of COVID were going to struggle in math and reading. And we needed someone to come in and help us make sure that our quality of instruction was as high as possible from teacher to teacher. And in many ways, create, uh, continue to create the excellence that we all expect and have come to expect. And lastly, um, we're taking care of our building, our brand new building that did sort of become an afterthought in all of this. <laughs> Um, but we did, uh, we did just complete a 300,000 square foot new building up on the hill that will soon be uh, renamed ceremonially uh, Meridian High School. Uh, and, and we want to take care of that uh, huge capital improvement that our, that our city and our schools have put so much money and time into. So uh, making sure that it's cleaned, making sure that it's maintained is important. So we've added some custodial support uh, to that. So in the end, um, this has been uh, a very well supported budget, not only by the school board, not only by the staff, but by the community in our uh, conversations and hearing community based feedback as well. Um, so tonight, Madam Chair, I'm, I'll turn it back to you in just a second to um, work through the motions necessary to pass one the operational budget. Um, the second is our um, school food services budget. And lastly, our community services budget. And again, just in terms of those two budgets, I wanna thank Richard Kane and his staff, along with Kristen, uh, working through the school's food services budget. And wanna take just a second to thank Katie Clinton as well uh, for her work on the community services fund um, and Kristen as well. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Noonan. And I would just like to quickly reiterate, I know you mentioned a lot of the staff, but to, to all of you, we really thank you for all the work you've, you've done on this budget. I know every year it's a major chunk of your time and effort and, and we really appreciate it. Um, we do also want to thank the city council um, for continuing to work with us and this year honoring the budget we put forward that really means a lot. And, and to, finally, um, we're glad we can do some compensation for our teachers because I think we all see them as, as core to what happens every day. And it could always be more, but it, I, I think we, we're happy we're making some progress. So, um, so with that, if there aren't further questions, any 
our comments from the board. I will go ahead and take a motion to adopt the school operating budget. Dr. Anderson. Chair Linton, I move that the school board adopt the 2021-2022 school operating fund budget in the amount of $53,762,781, requiring a city appropriation of $43,796,657. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Do we have a second? Second. second. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Ms. Goodell. Yes. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Solanos? Yes. Thank you. And the motion passes. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right. Can we have a motion now for the food services budget? Mr. Reitinger. Chair Litton, I move that the school board adopt the 2021-2022 school food services budget with receipts and disbursements in the amount of $1,025,357. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Downs, Ms. Goodell. Yes. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Golanos? Yes. Thank you, and the motion passes. Great, thank you, Ms. Goodell. And now can we have a motion on the Community Services Fund? Dr. Dimmick. Chair, I move that the school board adopt the 2021-22 Community Services Fund budget in the amount of $2,333,700, requiring a total city appropriation of $107,500. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Do we have a second? Uh, Ms. Ruiz Milanos. Thank you. Ms. Goodell. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. And the motion passes. Great. Thank you, everybody. And thanks to everybody for for all the work on the budget this year. All right, next, um, 8.04 is the superintendent's year in review, and I will turn it over to Dr. Noonan for that. Thank you, Chair Litton. I am gonna uh, attempt to pull up my screen here. Give me just a second so that I can share it with you. There we go. All right, um, I feel like I've done a lot of talking tonight. <laughs> I'll try to move through this uh, with relative speed. Um, this has been a challenging, um, a challenging presentation to put together to say the least uh, for a number of reasons. One is that um, we, we have uh, not had an opportunity really to be together to talk about some of these items uh, for a while and in the context of COVID. Um, it's been a challenge to sort of think about what our what our year really looks like. So um, if you'll indulge me, I, I did want to start um, briefly with, uh, come on, that's not what I want to show, um, with the uh, mission statement, because I do think it's important for us to continually think about what is our North Star? What is the one thing that we as a school division want to continue to strive for uh, and make sure that we're achieving whenever possible? So when we look at our our mission statement, and I, I, it's been a while since we've had a chance to look at it together. Um, I won't read it, but there are some things that really pop out that I think were evidenced this year in ways that um, were unique 
um, challenging, but also incredibly uh, rewarding. And the first is that we are student-centered, innovative and inclusive. And if you think about the instructional program models that we've been able to offer since the closure in March, um, all of those were predicated on being student-centered, innovative and inclusive of everyone in our community. Um, and at the same time, we are deeply committed to and continue to work very hard on being the premier international baccalaureate school division across the country and across the world. And as a consequence of that, really ensuring that we have a personalized learning environment for each of our kids, um, which dictated that we did some things very differently throughout this year and throughout the pandemic than maybe even other schools did. Uh, and I wanna take just a second as I get into talking about this to thank our uh, Empress of COVID, Rebecca Sharp, who's on again tonight, uh, because she really has been um, a, a driving force behind ensuring that each of our students in the city of Falls Church schools got a personalized environment that meet, meets each of their unique needs. Um, and then also all, always striving to be responsible, caring and internationally minded students. So I wanna start with just setting a little bit of the context. Um, and I wanna go back to March 13th, 2020. Um, and it feels like uh, uh, 10 years ago to me. Um, and it's been a challenge ever since that day. That was the Friday the 13th, just by the way. And that was the day that the governor ordered that all of the schools in Virginia be closed. And I, I wanna just say that um, because of our unique situatedness, uh, being in the city of Falls Church, having such a strength of team, having such a strength of board, and having such a strength of community, um, we actually closed schools on March 12th, which was the day before the, the governor closed the schools, because we knew as a community and as a staff and as a board that something was happening that wasn't going to be good uh, as we moved forward. And so that was the first moment where I think that this board and our staff really took a courageous leadership stand and said that we are gonna close. And it wasn't an easy thing to do, but it was the right thing for us to do. Um, prior to that, we were in a retreat about uh, two weeks before where I had a chance, or three weeks before, where I had a chance to work with the, the top level administrators in our division and ask them to, when they go back to school, just in case, can you put together two weeks of lesson plans in case we have to close? And because of that, we were able to stand up an online program very quickly that would at least allow us to continue some continuity of instructional service for our students as quickly as seven days following that closure. We were the first school division to return our kids into an instructional program um, in the Northern region. And it was because of our staff and being avail and availing themselves to um, technology and being ready with those lesson plans. We also, uh, in the fall of 2020, we're the first division in Northern Virginia to return most of our at-risk students and many of our special ed kids to classrooms for the first time in face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, it wasn't every day to start, that's for sure, because we knew we had to take some things slowly and be measured in our approach, um, but we were able to bring many of our students back, and I, and I want to congratulate our staff for that. Um, we were the first division in no Northern Virginia to return our students to a hybrid model of instruction, and then in late winter, um, continued in that uh, hybrid and then ultimately had to return back to, unfortunately, the online. But then fast forward to the early spring, um, not too, too long ago, but after spring break, we were the first division in, in Northern Virginia to return all of our students back to in-person learning with the exception of the Wednesday asynchronous day for secondary students. So one indicator I think of our success throughout this incredible journey uh, and I don't know in any other way to, to describe it, has, has been a journey, uh, and not one, frankly, I'd like to go through again, just to be perfectly honest, um, is that when we did return back to school, 99.5% of our elementary students and parents decided to return their students to full-time instruction, and 90% of our secondary students did as well. I was speaking to a colleague of mine in, an, in a neighboring district um, three days ago on Friday, and I asked this person who's a principal in one of the buildings in the neighboring district, how many of his students returned to school? And he said in his division, his school is the high water mark. And 60% of the students at his school have returned to in-person learning. And that means something to me because it, it, we see schools that are as low as 
in in-person learning in surrounding jurisdictions. And what it says to me is that our staff, first of all, has incredible relationships with our families. We're small, we know our students. Um, we've been able to provide a variety of different instructional methods to our students throughout the school year. Our staff has been incredibly flexible. But more than anything, um, we've been able to engage in solid mitigation strategies. Uh, we've proven that we can be safe. And our community has, I believe, a strong sense of trust and confidence in the work that we do here in the city of Falls Church Schools. And I think that that's evidenced by the fact that we're, we have such high rates of return of students. Um, I, I, I would argue that our communication through the pandemic has been excellent. Um, and while there have been some people who would argue the other direction, uh, the vast majority of people that I've spoken to have really been appreciative of the continuous co communication that's come home nearly every Friday. We've sort of stopped doing every Friday now that we're sort of coming out of it. But for several months, we were communicating every Tuesday and every Friday, and then every Friday as well going forward. And I think that this is something that we can be really proud of as a team. It's not just my work, it's not just our work, it's, it's your work too as a board. Um, and irrespective of the pandemic, we also were able to accomplish some other things, <laughs> sort of as was noted earlier tonight. Um, we have actually delivered a brand new state-of-the-art high school on time and on budget, um, which, which in and of itself could have been a huge challenge because there were 500, on some days, there were 500 people on that site working to build that new high school. All of them could have gotten COVID and could have shut down that site in a moment. But I wanna thank Gilbane Construction. I wanna thank Quinn Evans and Stantec and the architects. And I wanna thank Brailsford and Dunleavy for all of the work that they did also to implement really strong mitigation strategies. And I wanna, I also wanna say, you know, one of the things that's been really beautiful about this partnership between the private sector and the public school is that they've become part of our family to the extent that we even immunized many of the people from Brailsford and Dunleavy, many of the people from Gilbane, and, and even some folks from Stantec and, and Axios as well. Um, not only did we finish the high school on time and on budget, but we also were able to move our students back uh, and make that big move over from the high school during winter break. Um, it's a, one of those weekends and, and those long nights that I'll never forget in my professional career where I was moving rolling boxes right alongside the chief operating officer, Kristen Michael, and the chief academic officer, William Bates, and others um, to make sure that we got everything moved over in time. Uh, and there was no task that was too small or beyond any of us. And we all did what needed to be done to make sure that that job got taken care of. And, and then we also have now moved to the, to the construction um, uh, to the demolition of the old high school. And if you haven't been by, I wouldn't wait too much longer because <laughs> there's not gonna be much more to see for a while. Um, but in the next couple of days, they'll be digging out the foundational walls that will become part of our trapezoid in the future. And we continue to be on track with that on budget and on time. Um, for me personally, I continue to be very proud of the strong relationships that we have with the general government and the city council. Had it not been for the partnership of Wyatt Shields and some of the council members and staff members on the city side, I'm not confident, confident that we would have gotten where we are with the high school. Um, it took all of their efforts as well to light fires under inspectors to make sure that um, certain things got mobilized in time. And, I, and, and part of the credit for the high school also goes to them. And I, I wanna thank them for that. But more importantly, as I indicated before, or not more importantly, in addition, um, we've also been able to work within the budget guidance, um, and that's been through a good partnership with the city, city government and uh, general government staff. But during the pandemic, we've been also relentless in our work uh, around diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And I think that that's been borne out not only in words, but in deeds. Um, and the first is that um, one of the things that we did right at the beginning of the pandemic was we ensured that the people who were most at risk during the pandemic, who are our, our uh, employees, who were bus drivers, who were food service workers, who were custodial staff, who were daycare workers, for people who are most at risk of being rift or doing a reduction in force, that we would do whatever it took to make sure that they maintained their job here in the city of Falls Church Schools. 
And to that extent, we were able to diversify job responsibilities and redeploy all of our staff members so that no one had to be, um, lose their job. Additionally, we've made significant roads in hiring, uh, inroads in hiring, um, particularly around leaders of color and staff of color. Over the past two years, with the support of William Bates, our new chief academic officer, I guess I can't call him new anymore. He's been around a while. He's even got a gray beard now. I said we've turned him gray. Um, we've, we've been able to uh, establish a division level equity team in conjunction with Dr. Jennifer Santiago and her work. Um, that has provided extraordinary support in professional development, reviewing our current policies and procedures around equity, really taking the lead um, to ensure that our efforts here in the City of Falls Church are aligned to not only best practices in curriculum and instruction, but also best practices in equity. And lastly, around equity, you as a board have taken on a strong leadership posture in adopting one of the strongest diversity, equity, and inclusion policies in the Commonwealth of Virginia that I've seen since April. And I wanna thank Dr. Dimmick for her work on that. But all of that has been happening while in the midst of COVID. So it's not um, something that wasn't, uh, it, it COVID, although it was terrible and there were many people that were very sick and died, we were able to maintain some momentum with our work here in the city of Falls Church. So knowing that that was the context of the experience that we've had in the last year or plus, there are some unique goals perhaps that we found ourselves really trying to achieve um, that would not have normally come up. And the first is making sure that our students and our staff are safe. Um, we continue to beat the drum around safety. We continue to beat the drum um, saying that we were going to use data to drive our decision making, that we were going to look at the science, we were going to listen to the CDC. We also wanted to provide continuous quality instructional programming. And for better or for worse, um, we didn't miss a beat in terms of instruction. Where it happened was the only thing that was different. Some of it happened online, some of it happened face to face. But as we see some of the data that's starting to come out, what we're seeing are the fruits of our labor. We're seeing and then it's just one measure, but SOLs have begun and we're getting early data back that shows that not only did we not lose ground, but we actually gained ground. And so we look forward to sharing those data with you when they, when they are available. Um, we also have supported our families and our staff in ways that I think are unique as well. I'll talk about some of those in just a second. We've provided multiple service delivery models consistent with COVID developments. We, we didn't know, there were days, weeks, and months that we didn't know whether we were coming or going in terms of how we were going to deliver instructional programming because there truly wasn't any guidance for us for the first five or six months of this pandemic. But that being said, we were able to stand up, as I said, an online instructional program. We were able to bring in students hybrid uh, and the like, and then ultimately reopen our schools effectively and efficiently um, with the guidance of the CDC and other organizations. But again, we didn't throw out these three big ideas, right? We, we said all along that we still wanted to maintain our focus on international baccalaureate for all of our students, creating a caring community and culture and closing gaps. But what that looked like going forward might look a little bit different than what one might expect when uh, under normal circumstances. So what, I've tried, what we've tried to do is try to align some of the work that we've done under each of these um, to give you a sense of kind of where, where we are in terms of our goals. Um, the first, first is around IB. And for those of you that weren't able to be part of it, we had our first IB online celebration of excellence not too long ago. And it really was an extraordinary opportunity for our students to um, come together as teams, work with their mentors and talk about some of the really great work that they, they had done. Um, and it took a lot of creativity, it took a lot of thoughtfulness and it took a lot of care to make that happen. Um, we continue to prepare for our multi-year evaluation. We have our dates for that. It will be March of 22, uh, that the IB team will be here to provide us with our MYP uh, multi-year evaluation. And we are using the Wednesdays with our secondary teams for the rest of this year to really leverage the opportunity for them to come together, work on their approaches to learning, excuse me, work on their approaches to teaching, work on their unit development, and continue to incorporate all of the, the strategies and skills necessary for us to be successful in the IB audit. Um, this year or next year, when we do have the audit, it's gonna be very different than 
audits in the past, and likely we'll do a work session at some point with you to talk about what it's going to look like. Uh, but the expectations for us are going to be very high. Um, really proud. I, I put Dr. Rory Dippold in here into the presentation because Dr. Dippold has taken um, on this leadership challenge for us as the MYP coordinator to really build capacity in grades six through 10 with not only the students, but the teachers that he gets to work with. And he's a known quantity. Um, he does extraordinary work in terms of professional development, professional learning. He's relational, people admire him and really work hard on his behalf. And he's been a real asset to our, to our buildings. And within that, he has continued to grow our standards-based learning and grading program at Henderson and at Mason to the extent that International Baccalaureate has contacted us and asked us to do a presentation and to participate in an action research project because we are one of the exemplars of what um, standards-based learning and grading looks like at the middle school level. So we're very excited about that. Um, and then the last bullet on here is that we are in the process of developing our Falls Church City Public School Sustainability Academy that's rooted in not only the work of the IB, but also allows us to leverage the capacity of our science teachers, our math teachers, our CTE teachers and the like, as well as our new building to become a teaching tool. So yes, just yesterday, we had another meeting about this and um, the visioning that has gone into this and the work that's going on is really um, quite exciting. In fact, next year at the high school, we'll offer our first core foundational course um, with respect to the Sustainability Academy called Power and Energy. And that Power and Energy um, elective is the launching pad for our um, future Sustainability Academy. Um, so in terms of closing gaps, which is the second thing, we, we are not seeing, and, and let, me, let me preface this just for a second, because I, I wanna be really clear. We, we aren't seeing any significant learning loss when we look at the STAR data, we look at the math STAR data and the reading STAR data. We're starting to see the SOL results come in. We're not seeing significant loss in the SOL results that we've seen so far. That doesn't mean that there hasn't been loss. And I wanna be really clear about that. I think what we are accustomed to in the city of Falls Church is not just meeting the standard, we're accustomed to exceeding the standard. And I think for the most part, first of all, our kids have met the standard. Have we been able to exceed the standard like we've been able to in the past during a COVID crisis? Probably not to the extent that we would normally be able to do that. But knowing that, knowing that we've been in such extraordinary times, I am pleased to report that on balance, it looks as though our student growth measures, whether it's STAR, reading and math, or our SOLs, really appear to be holding steady and actually in some cases going up. So um, again, we'll report those data when they come out, but I did wanna, wanna let everybody know that. Um, we have, uh, in terms of closing gaps, really provided as much psychological and social work services as we ever have. I wanna thank the social work team and the psych team under the direction of uh, Rebecca Sharp and, and William Bates it resides in our instructional department where it should reside, um, but they have worked incredibly hard to connect with families and, and through that um, have ensured that continuity of service, um, helped us return our special high needs special education and ESOL students. Um, and then lastly on this slide is, is working with our teachers to create summer learning recovery plans that are really focused on mathematics and literacy. And I'm pleased to announce um, that we actually are fully staffed for the summer. Um, and uh, that was a trick to be able to get enough people into the um, positions that we had, but we hired some really great summer leaders who went out and beat the bushes and we got some really great people to step in and step up. So once um, we get the students signed up, which, are which is coming, uh, we will have staff to support them. And lastly, in terms of the caring community, um, you know, in terms of equity, one of the things that the division leadership team has been working on is formalizing an action plan. And they do use a, a, a systems approach to the work that's been happening. They identify a problem of practice. Then they identify the theory of action about how that problem of practice is going to be uh, utilized or how that theory of action is gonna be utilized to resolve that problem of practice uh, and then come forward with those action plans. Um, and, and so we're, we're really proud of the work that that division leadership team has, 
has done uh, to encourage not only academic but also non-academic conversations around equity and the like. Um, again, caring for our employees. I, I mentioned this before, no RIF. We also provided free supervision for our students um, of staff to support our teaching and working in our buildings while, while they were learning virtually. And there are a number of reasons why we did that. Um, and I know that that was somewhat controversial with some people in the community wanting to know why we would take care of our staff kids and not take care of um, everybody. Um, and the truth of it is, if we didn't provide that opportunity for our staff, um, our staff would have taken leave for us, uh, from us to be able to care for their children for months at a time. So it was a way for us to be able to maintain staff by providing that supervision for their students. And it was appreciated um, by many. Um, we got to meet some new friends that go to different school divisions. Um, some of the funniest, some of my funniest interactions this year have been kids who have been in that uh, learning experience um, and it was very positive. We also have been able to um, support our staff with vaccine pods and, and all of you that wanted to take it up as well. Uh, and I do think that that was, that was appreciated by our staff and it helped us get back sooner rather than later. We worked with the PTAs and the Falls Church Ed Foundation to recognize and thank our operations staff. And that's been the focus of the work the last month. Um, and it's truly appreciated by our operations folks. Um, weekly appreciations from central office to our school buildings. Once we've reopened, we try to do something for everyone every Friday uh, from cookies to uh, seeds, uh, wildflower seeds to uh, candy bars and, and all kinds of things, just to let people know we're thinking about them. And then um, we did continue with our annual awards programs through the Falls Church Ed Foundation and wanna thank them uh, tremendously for their support. In terms of caring community and culture, some of the other things we paid attention to were the financial and food assistance for the community. And our food service worked diligently under the direction of Kristen Michael to provide these weekly meals for our families in need um, and, and really was able to work closely with our social workers to make sure that that happened. We wanna thank the Ed Foundation who also deployed their family assistance fund to uh, support our families. And that fund raised more than $160,000 from our extraordinarily generous community to, to support the things that you see there, whether it's food assistance, rental assistance, health care, food <coughs> certificates, and even holiday financial and gift assistance. And that was all, all done through the Ed Foundation with the support of the schools because we didn't want to leave any family wanting for uh, more than they had to want for. The next is around preserving some memories. Um, you know, we did um, host a, a say goodbye to George Mason High School. Uh, we let people come in and, and uh, give some, uh, purchase some memorabilia. We did the one last visit for two days. We did an online auction and yard sale with all of the equipment and stuff that were in the building and we raised $60,000. So not only did it raise money for us, but it also kept things out of the landfill, which is also part of us being a caring community. And then the Falls Church Ed Foundation supported us with the legacy kiosk where we've been able to do a comprehensive website that provides a lot of documentation of our proud history here, here in the city of Falls Church. <laughs> and then a few other things just to, of notice or of note. Um, our monthly equity newsletter has been coming out. You all have been getting that through the Noonan's Notes. Um, want to thank um, <coughs> Patrick Garland, who's one of our teachers at the high school for his work really leading our History Matters, which highlights and honors the diversity uh, within the City of Falls Church. Um, we have uh, been working diligently on workforce di uh, diversity <coughs> in all positions, especially leadership, and we'll continue to um, hit that hard. You all have renamed two schools. We see the percentage of those students that came back. We've welcomed and onboarded two really great school board members. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz Bolanos and Mr. Henderson for joining us. Um, and then we've been active and engaged with the PTAs, the PTSAs and the boosters and a couple of things that they've done there are noted here, but I also wanna thank them for their support with the hub monitoring. If it hadn't been for the support of the community, we wouldn't have been able to bring our kids back the way that we did uh, through that hub model. And they've been very helpful in that process. Um, again, sort of some things you note there. Um, 
that have already been noted, um, but Ms. Minson stepped away from the table. I wanted to give her credit for doing all the work on the policies. She has not slowed down one iota since the uh, since <laughs> the COVID hit us, but uh, she continues to work hard on on our policies, and I'm I'm really proud of her uh, for that. The third bullet here is something that we're really excited about, and I, I thought I'd share some numbers with you tonight. From what I can tell, we're the only division um, in Virginia that's offering a closed pod for our students who are 12 years and older. Uh, and we'll offer that pod um, in a couple of weeks uh, with a follow-up in June. Um, as of right now, we have 791 students signed up to be vaccinated in our closed pod, which will happen at Henderson. That's an extraordinary number. Um, we had a little bit of a side hustle with the health department and the over under was 500. And we said we would take the over because we just know our community, you know, they're, they're highly engaged and they were gonna, and they just laughed at us and they said, there's no way you're gonna get to 500. And we called them back and we said, we have 791. So the universe of students that were eligible for, for the vaccine is around 1100. And that includes 16, 17 and 18, 18 year olds. And we already know that a significant number of those students have been vaccinated. So. Um, this really does make a significant impact in our community to offer this pod. And I want to thank the Fairfax County Health Department for their help. So I also wanted to include some things in here that are, are areas of growth um, for us moving forward. Not only in those three big buckets that we've talked about in terms of closing the gap, um, making sure that we have international baccalaureate and the caring community, but we also want to move through sort of this recovery phase of, and, I, and I believe that we're sort of in the recovery phase of the pandemic. We're not out of the woods yet, but we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel and move back into the development phase, which allows us then to get back to achieving those high levels of uh, instructional programming for kids that we know we can do uh, when we have the full complement of resources available to us. And those resources being, of course, our kids in front of us and our staff and buildings. I think it's really incumbent upon us as leaders, um, not only in our division, but across the state in the United States that we rebuild the resiliency stores and factors for our staff and our faculty. Um, our, our staff and faculty are tired. They're worn out and they have put it all in um, and, and they're gonna get to the end and they're gonna do it with grace and class like they always do, but they need some time this summer to rebuild. So how do we, how do we help them rebuild? I think it's time that we engage or re-engage in a strategic planning process. Um, <clears throat> we have traditionally used the triennial plan as sort of our guidepost for the work that we do. Um, but I, I would submit to the board and I'll put something in this week's update that now's the time that we consider doing a five-year strategic plan um, that becomes not only just a strategic future plan, but a short-term recovery plan. What do we do for the next six months to get us where we need to go? into the future. And then continuing to focus on curriculum and instruction through an equity lens. And I, again, wanna thank the board, thank William uh, and the DLT team and Jen Santiago and others for their work in this process. So when I think about our strategic movement forward, um, I think we are moving from crisis to recovery. Uh, I think we're deep in, into the weeds of recovery now. Uh, and, and, and I only say that because now we're able to think strategically and think forward. Uh, we haven't been able to think forward for a while. So I think we're in recovery and, and now we'll move into development through the summer and I'm excited about that. So as I reflected on um, you know, the work of the schools uh, over the course of the last year, I would just leave you with this and that is that I think we have a lot in the system to be proud of. Um, were we frustrated at times? Yes. Were people angry at times? Yes. Were we, were we left wanting more? Well, who wasn't? <laughs> I mean, we were in the middle of a pandemic and of course we were all wanting more, but given the context and the experience that we've been in for the last 16 months, I, I do think we have a lot to be proud of as we move through this crisis, move towards resilience as an organization and set a course and a path forward for us to achieve our really thoughtful, um, lofty goals of being the best IB school division in the country, making sure that we have a very strong caring community that has equity as its focus and making sure um, 
making sure that we're meeting every, every need of our kids. So with that, um, Madam Chair, that's, a, that's a, long, a long way of saying thank you and that's sort of a review, but uh, I'd be open to taking any questions that the board may have. Go ahead, Vice Chair Downs. Thank you, Chair Lewton. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. That was a really thorough presentation. And, um, you know, I agree. Thank you to all those in the room and um, to, especially to the teachers. Uh, this has been an incredible year. You know, I think for me, one of the um, moments of pride was when we were able to get our uh, special ed education students and our ESOL learners back in the classroom before pretty much anyone in Northern Virginia. And so I just want to thank um, the ESOL staff as well as the special education uh, teachers for that. I think that was really um, something that made me especially proud that we were able to do that. And um, again, your leadership, Dr. Noonan, with getting our teachers vaccinated and just trying to sort of muddle through this year without any leadership from the federal government, state or local. So thank you again for everything. Um, and again, to the teachers, parents, I know we, we you all, um, hung in there and, and it was a trying year. But uh, what I wanted to just, um, I guess, throw out there is, you know, one of the things in fall of 2019 was the standards-based grading rollout. And um, it, as we all know, it wasn't, it's always the smoothest rollout. And, and then we, the pandemic hit in March. So um, I think, you know, in my personal, you know, I have two at the high school. I think, you know, it's something that is not, people are still trying to, learn and get their hands on. And, you know, I hear it from both parents and students sort of, you know, it's not a natural thing, trying to re change is hard. So I think that's something that um, I'd like us to sort of now that we're coming up for air, maybe revisiting that just to see like, are we being as clear as we can? I, th I think one of the, again, speaking for my own children, um, you know, just not always knowing where they are and how they're doing. And, and you know, because it's just not a natural, you know, everyone's used to the traditional grading system. So if we could maybe, and maybe that's part of the work session when we talk about IB some more, but maybe we could um, touch on that a little bit down the line. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in 2019, when the rollout wasn't where we wanted it to be, we did pull back and sort of press pause um, to, to double down on the work at the middle school and some ninth grade. Um, and so we, we certainly can revisit that. Um, I know that Dr. Dippold has made some pretty good inroads with many of the teachers. And as I said, IB is looking to us as the experts, um, but at middle school, not necessarily at the high school yet. So uh, we recognize that there's some work to do there. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Do we have any other, uh, Mr. Reidinger, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Lytton, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Noonan, for the presentation. Um, as I said in my comments earlier, I think it was a very difficult year, and um, I think we were able to get a lot accomplished. Um, I look forward to the opportunity to bring in um, the uh, ESOL and health and wellness committees and some of the people who spoke to them about some of the things that happened most recently in the pandemic and some of the things the schools and cities have been um, doing. It's, it's really awe-inspiring the way people have banded together to help each other. Um, <clears throat> but the main thing I wanted to talk about um, is not actually the looking back, but the looking forward part. Um, you mentioned in your comments about the, uh, the need to turn to a new strategic plan, whether it's a three-year or a five-year. Um, I, I, think, I think we are at a, at a, at a critical juncture um, for that activity. Um, as you pointed out, the time has come to renew our plan, whether it's a triennial plan or a five-year plan. Um, and there are a lot of things that are sort of coming together at the same time. You know, we're coming out of a pandemic that taught us a lot of things about how one can educate, the importance of being in person, but also some of the things that you can do with remote education. For the first time since I've been on the board, um, we're not dealing with a situation where we're going to have massive overcrowding in one school um, next year. We actually have, you know, can have a little bit of a break um, and maybe a longer one because um, for the last couple of years we've we've seen a tail off in the 
the very, very rapid growth. It may come back, it may not, but we may not actually have soaring student populations like we used to have. And so this, and we've also fully implemented now for a number of years, the, the personalized learning program. And this is our first real opportunity I think with you as the school board super as a school superintendent to do a, a a really deep strategic planning process because the last time we did it it was still fairly new in your term so all of that to me that's a lot of things coming together says the time is right to pull together and, and look ahead I'm, I'm not yet convinced that five years is the right period it feels to me like that's awfully far in the future um, but i think we need to look at what's the art of the possible um, how can we take from the difficult times we've been through the last few years and, and do our jobs even better? And, and what, can we, what can we learn? What can we do with the resources we've got? How can we use this new building? How can we use the facilities? We've got a little bit of space now, um, I hope, to try and do our day-to-day -day jobs much, much better. Um, and so um, that's a long-winded way of saying I'm looking forward very much to the next strategic planning process um, over the course of the summer, and um, I, I look forward to the first ideas in the board discussion about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Redinger. I, I too look forward to it. That's uh, being being able to think about the future um, for the first time in a while sort of gets my uh, juices flowing. So should be should be a good conversation. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Uh, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Chair Lytton. Um, I also agree with Ms. Reininger. I'm looking forward to the strategic planning process. Uh, you know, this is, this is an opportunity as we're finally, <laughs> how many times have I said this? Seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and um, for once we think it's daylight. Um, it's time to be, time to do that looking forward. In a shorter term frame, there's a couple of things that I wanted to ask about that um, you touched on a bit, Dr. Noonan, in your presentation. Um, summer school for those students who, who wish it. Um, do we feel like we, you, you indicate you, we think we have enough staffing, but how is that actually looking? How are we doing on recruiting the folks that we need, given how tired everybody is? We actually are fully staffed. Um, we've got everybody that we need. Uh, for all the programs that we're going to run. I want to thank uh, Mr. Bates for, for pulling all that together. Um, we have, as I indicated, some really good site-based leaders that have been identified that are aspiring administrators and the like uh, that were also very helpful in uh, doing some recruiting. Um, so we have not only teachers, but we also have some paraprofessionals that are going to come in as well. So feeling really confident about it. Thank you. Okay, that's great news. Um, and then the other, the other question we were, you were also talking about helping folks recover. And what I'm curious about is um, what sorts of activities, what sorts of things um, are, could you share at this point for recovery support? And is there anything that the board could be helpful with in, in helping any of that come to, come to fruition? I think part of the recovery strategy is, is ensuring um, one, that we have the appropriate social emotional um, health um, support in place. And I think what you've done tonight in terms of passing the budget um, allows us to hire another social worker, allows us to hire another school counselor. Um, then there's the academic support. We've been able to make some moves internally um, to hire a math specialist at Thomas Jefferson, to also have a, a division-wide literacy coordinator that's gonna help us with some of the reading and the like. Um, I think the work that you all, it's funny, I, it's funny you asked that question because I, I was attending a meeting yesterday for the Sustainability Academy and I really like visioning a lot, but then I found myself in the position of, well, what can I do to help you? And all anybody said was give us money. Um, so, so I feel like um, I don't wanna say the same thing to you, but I think just being able to generally continue to be supportive of, of the work that we're trying to accomplish, but also be our ears to the ground. And if you're hearing of families in need, uh, or if you're hearing that there's a gap in service that we can um, fill, we certainly wanna avail ourselves to that uh, as well. So uh, I think, I think what, what you have done already has been really supportive, certainly passing this budget, but again, kind of keeping your ear to the ground would be really helpful to us. And listening to the voices that sometimes aren't heard and that, that's something um, that's really important too. 
is that we, we do hear from a few voices that can be kind of loud, but there are a lot of people out there who don't know how to advocate well or don't know how to navigate a system. And I think being able to outreach to some of those families um, will be a key aspect to our recovery as well, because they often are underrepresented in the process of school, whether there are people who are in poverty or people who have been marginalized for some other reason. So um, it, would be, it would be really useful for the board to continue to outreach to some of the communities that have traditionally been underrepresented. Thank you, Dr. Newton, for that. And, and uh, I'm looking at Dr. Ruiz Bolanos um, because we had a conversation just recently about um, how some of the communities that we do not hear from much because they're quiet, when we do hear from them, um, that really, we need to be listening really hard for that because it takes so much for the folks in those communities to actually reach out and raise concerns um, given what they're given what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and so yeah thank you I appreciate that extra extra reminder was there anything else from anyone oh Ms Snyder thank you chair Litton um, so first, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for all the work that you're doing, especially Dr. Noonan, to get us through this year. Um, and then I guess my question was, um, you mentioned where SOL scores look like they are for this year. Um, and I was wondering whether there would be the opportunity um, at a future meeting, maybe in the next couple of months for the board to look at like scores from this year and similar to our meeting a few months ago um, just to kind of examine the trends and make sure that we're on track. Yeah, um, Ms. Snyder, thank you. That's a great question. Um, there's a, the answer, the short answer to your question is yes. The longer answer is that there is a validation period that we need to go through and a scrubbing of the data. Um, that sometimes takes a little bit longer. And unfortunately, they're never really quite done in time for the end of the school year. Um, but let us work hard. Jeannie Seabridge, who is our um, assessment coordinator, uh, director of assessment, uh, has been keeping Mr. Bates and I sort of up to speed every hour on the hour, it seems like. Um, so as we learn more, um, we'll certainly share that, those data with you. I just don't know that we're going to have a final completed scrubbed validated set of data that would be available probably until even the fall, but we can give you some preliminary information if that's acceptable. That sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Uh, Ms. Ruiz Bolanos. Hi, thank you, Dr. Noonan for this presentation and truly a walk down memory lane be it good or bad, and just the unsurmountable tasks that you have had to face and your team. Um, I just wanted to talk about the division offering the closed pod to the students. I thought that was great what you said, that we did have such an engaged community. Is there any way to know if those that responded are part of the ESOL community and how their response rate was, I don't, I, I don't know if you have that level of data, but um, just knowing the vaccine hesitancy in some pockets, I wanted to know if, um, if that was trickling down to the students and the children as well. Uh, Dr. Ruiz Palanos, that's a really great question. I don't know that we have it to the level of detail of ethnicity, um, but because it's such a small number of students, one of the things we might be able to do is do a crosswalk to see who has signed up. So um, I don't want to add that to somebody's plate without talking to them first, but I do understand your question. Um, and we have done some extra outreach to the ESOL community uh, to try to get them in through our social workers and through others, but um, we certainly will look at that. Thank you for reminding us of that important notice. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right, 
see none. I will just say um, thank you for that, Dr. Noonan. It's it's great to be in a place of starting to look back at this year and looking forward. I think we're all excited about that. So with that, we will move on. The next three items on our agenda are related to policies. So I'm assuming we'll be turning that over to Ms. Minson. You are. And I'm going to step away from the table for a minute. I'll be right back. Very good. Good evening. Um, tonight we have three policies for proposed waiving first reading and moving to second reading. The first of those is policy 8.30 emergency aid CPR and AED certified personnel um, would be replaced by policy EBBA. Um, this new VSBA policy is identical to the current policy and fully in line with what we're doing. Respectfully, we suggest waiving first reading and adopting this policy. Any questions about policy EBBA? Uh, go ahead, Ms. Dimmick. Thank you. Um, this isn't exactly about the policy, but I was curious in reading the policy, how we make sure we stick to it with, um, you know, when teachers or staff might be out sick or on leave or something, how do we know that we always have the right number of people in a school um, to, to follow this policy? That is a great question. I believe that the principals are responsible for that in each of their buildings. Um, but I also do know that there was a waiver of this requirement by the state during COVID. So I can make sure with the principals coming up for this next school year that we ensure we have the, all the people properly trained. Um, so Thank you. Curious. Any other questions on policy EBBA? Seeing none, the next policy for waiver first reading is policy BDD, electronic participation in meetings from remote locations. This policy was previously adopted by the board and the only addition um, at this time would be adding the line at line one, um, that there can be electronic participation in meetings from remote, remote locations as otherwise permitted by law and adding the reference to um, the acts of the General Assembly that changed that, um, that section. Questions about policy BDD? All right, and then the last policy for waiver of first reading and second reading adoption is policy BDDH. The VSBA has added this as also policy KD so that it appears also under um, the sections of the policies that relate to community engagement. So right now it's organized under board governance and operations. By adding it as policy KD, it would also appear in the section school and community relations. So um, pretty perfunctory change, but important to make sure that members of the public know how they can participate in board meetings. Questions about policy BDDHKD? I can, okay. I will pull the mic closer. Any questions about policy BDDH slash KD? All right, that, those are the only policies for waiver first reading and proposing of second reading and adoption. All right, so can I get a motion on waiver first reading? Uh, Dr. Dimmick, go ahead. I move that the school board waive first reading and approve and adopt second reading of policies EBBA, emergency first aid CPR and AED certifi certified personnel, BDD, electronic participation in meetings and remote locations, and BDDH slash KD, public participation at school board meetings as presented. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Uh, Ms. Giddell. Uh, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you, and the motion passes. Great, thank you, Ms. Giddell. And I will hand it back over to Ms. Minson. Thank you. For our second reading this evening, we have three policies from our April meeting. The first policy, KA goals for school community relations. Um, there was one change from first to second reading, replacing the word programs on line nine with the word methods, so that it's clear that the school board regularly evaluates the methods for maintaining open channels of communication. Otherwise, there were no changes to policy KA. Questions about this policy? Seeing none, the next policy is policy KB, public information program. 
um, we added that the superintendent and the board will utilize appropriate means to communicate with the media. That changes at line six and seven. Otherwise, there were no changes from first reading. Questions on policy KB? And then the last policy for second reading this evening is policy GAA staff time schedules. There were no proposed changes from first reading last month. Any questions about policy GAA? Very good. All right, seeing none, um, can we get a motion on approval of second reading and adoption? Just tear it down. Chair Litton, I move that the school board approve second reading and adoption of policies KA, goals for school community relations, KB, public information program, and GAA, staff time schedules as presented. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Do we have a second? Second. Oh, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Goodell. Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. Yes. Thank you. And the motion passes. All right. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. And back to you, Ms. Minson. Thank you. But there are nine policies for first reading this evening. Um, that is a lot more than I normally try to conquer. Um, but recognizing that Sevi Padilla is leaving as our facilities director and Nancy Hendrickson is leaving as our transportation director, we wanted to try to get those policies up to date while we're using the great institutional knowledge that we have. So when we get great new staff to join us, we have clear policies of what the expectations are going forward. So many, many thanks to Chris and Michael for sitting down and helping me go through these. And then to Sevi and Nancy, I think we'll have more policies related to facilities in June, um, but we have definitely a few facilities and a number of transportation policies this evening. The first is facilities policy FB, facilities planning. This would re replace our current policy 430, which frankly is a lot more detailed and gets into the weeds of how um, the school division does capital improvement planning and facilities development and property acquisition. Our proposal is to move to the much more simple VSBA policy, which in, is included in policy 4.30. And then we would um, work with Dr. Noonan and um, Ms. Michael to move um, the language from policy 4.30 and regulation 4.30 into a corresponding regulation that would go with policy FB. So FB complies with the VSBA model policies um, states what is required under the law and then would leave up to the superintendent's reg some of those more detailed portions of facility pl planning as it relates to capital improvement planning and facilities development. Any questions about policy FB facilities planning? All right, the next policy is ECA, inventory and reporting of loss or damage. This would replace current policy 4.28 inventory. Um, the policy is very similar to our current policy and certainly would not change any of our practices. Any questions about proposed policy ECA? All right, the next policy KGB, public conduct on school property would replace our current policy 5.11.1. Um, again, thank you to Ms. Michael. We made a number of modifications to the model policy from the VSBA in order to maintain those portions of policy 5.11.1 that appeared most important to FCCPS since 5.11.1 was most recently adopted in 2015, which is, as far as our policies go, was a fairly recent policy, though it did supersede my time here with the division. Um, the additions are reflected in red on policy KGB. Any questions about this um, proposed policy other than maybe Mr. Redinger noting that he likes the, Come on, the lettering? Don't let us down, Phil. We were counting on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a. Oh. It's still out. Okay. By Chair Downs. Thank ahead. you. Thank you, Chair Litton. Uh, thank you, Ms. Minson. Uh, two quick questions for this policy. On the very first opening line, I was wondering if we should add. Um, where it says all visitors must register, should we add a line that says providing photo identification or some identification? I mean, I know that that's required when we enter school buildings as visitors. We actually, if individuals don't have a photo identification can still enter their, their information oh, okay. on, on the system. So I don't know if it makes sense to add that, um, but if we think it'd be helpful to let folks know what to expect when coming to buildings, it could be added. Okay. 
that, I mean, that, I, you know, I, I'll leave that to you. Um, you know, I, I do know that that's generally, you know, what the, what the security um, staff are looking for is some sort of identification. So um, I'll leave that up to you. I just, I just wanted to throw that out there. The other sure. um, question I had was um, in the section about the weapons, yes. um, is there, should there be anything in there that if a weapon is found on someone on school grounds or did I miss it? Or is this not the right per place to put it? We, that's a very good question. We currently have a weapons policy in the student's code of conduct or under section J and there is a VSBA model policy GBEB on weapons. Um, we do wanna bring that policy in the coming months but recognizing that we don't yet have that policy updated we thought it made sense to bring the language over from 5.11.1 mm -hmm. And then once we get policy GBEB before the board, we can look back at policy KGB to determine okay. whether these lines 27 to 34 should remain or if they then can be removed. Okay. Great. Thank you. And I'm wondering, following up on your comment about um, this is required to show documentation, what if instead of specifying what it is, so all visitors must register to school office upon arrival, um, will be required? I'm sorry, but it, I can't hear the speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. I had turned my microphone off. I apologize, Mr. Reitinger. Um, following up on the comment from Vice Chair Downs on line five, what about changing it to say all visitors must register at the school office on arrival, comma, will be required to show documentation as requested, comma, and share, shall wear identification during their visit? That way, if we're not specifying it's a driver's license and if someone has a passport, that would be acceptable, but we wouldn't be getting into the specifics, but we are, as Ms. Downs indicated, I'm um, telling people that they will be required to show information upon arrival. I, I like, I think it just aids us in, in if someone were to um, sort of, you know, claim that they don't want to provide some sort, you know, I, I think it just backs us up a little bit. I like that idea, thank you. I can certainly add that for a second reading. Does that sound good to the board? Ms. Dimmick, Dr. Dimmick. I guess I, I'm wondering what happens if we have young people visit school. Young people typically have no ID. Like what if a high schooler comes and they don't have a driver's license or any ID? Does that, do we ever have that happen? I know using our lobby guard system, you can enter your name and your date of birth and still be checked through the state um, system to make sure that the individual has not been convicted of a sexual offense. But but typically we don't allow high school students into buildings during the school day or other students in during the school day, just as a as a operational rule. I will say I am one of those parents who one time forgot my ID and went up to volunteer, and I think they were able to still let me in. So I guess that would be my only concern. I mean, I know it's a fine line because we don't want to just be letting anyone in. Um, so I don't know how the language you recommended would, would deal with that. I think that Kristen's language does say required to show documentation as requested. So if there was a concern that someone said a name that we didn't believe was accurate or a birthday that changed or something along those lines, that would give our, our staff the ability to say, we're going to need something else. Can you share with us a state issued ID or can you share with us some other form of identification that can verify your name or the spelling thereof, that type of thing. Okay, great. Yeah, as we, as we rework this policy based on the conversation tonight, the one thing I want to be really careful of is that not everybody can get a state issued ID and um, we wouldn't want to inhibit a parent from being able to see their kid or go into a classroom because they didn't get a state issued ID. So I think documentation of some sort would be sufficient. Looks like, Phil, do you have a question too? Mr. Reitinger, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my comment is on the weapons provision, which I strongly support. Um, I, I just note that a lot of the paragraph seems to be unnecessary. Um, the, the second sentence, um, just talks about the rationale, and I, I'm not so sure we can cram all of that into one sentence. And then we repeat the first sentence and the subsequent sentences. Um, I wonder if it might have more force and require less re rewriting if we just included the first and the last sentences of the paragraph to say, uh, 
weapons are prohibited on Falls Church City schools. Um, violations of state law will be reported to law enforcement authorities. Um, and then that might not require a change in the future. It really has all the content that we have right now, and it's a little punchier and a little clearer. I don't feel strongly about it, but it, it, it I don't, I'm not sure the rest of that text is necessary. I, I think it would be fine to keep just sentence one at line 27 and the final sentence at line 34. It accomplishes what the board wants to do and kind of takes out some of the explanatory language that had been included in policy 5.11.1. So if, if other folks are amenable to that, that's certainly a change we can bring for a second reading. Seeing head nods, thanks. Uh, Mr. Henderson, go ahead. Yes, um, the city council, uh, didn't they pass a, a rule or a law regarding uh, weapons on public property in the city? And how is that, um, is, is this what we're, um, proposing uh, in a, addition to that? That's a very good question. My understanding of what the city passed related to city owned property. So parks, library, and um, city spaces, this would be related to school spaces, um, but otherwise is quite similar. Um, this also does rely on um, state law on weapons as it relates to school property. Cause my understanding is the city council went a little bit beyond what all what many other states and counties uh, allow for weapons. So we would be following school law precedent on this and, and the Virginia state laws that applies to school owned property. So are the school city owned property as well? No, schools are owned by the school board. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Reitinger, go ahead. I, I had one other comment just because Dr. Noonan expects it. Um, I'd say that calling this policy KGB is outdated with the new numbering system, it should be policy FSB. Uh, only you Intel nerds are gonna laugh at that. So don't worry about it. Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Chair Litton. Um, I, I, I get that reference, Phil. I was wondering whether or not we were gonna have a policy, not EBBA, but ABBA, but anyway. Um, I would support the um, comments that uh, Ms. Reiner made. Um, I also think just retaining the first sentence uh, on line 27 and the, the last sentence on line 34 of that paragraph would, um, would suffice. It would get the, um, I think it would get the, the clarity um, that we're looking for and, and, and make, the, you know, make the statement that we're looking for. Um, my only question is whether violations of state law or um, in order to avoid having a future revision, if not necessary, is it okay to say violations of applicable law, whether that's state law, federal law, local law, I, I know that's where I question in my mind. That's a good question. I actually don't know if there'd be any other, um, I, I, really it would be federal laws or regulations related to weapons on campus. I, I think we do always look to the state law, but I can look into that between now and second reading. And if, if there needs to be a change and I can give that feedback to you. Thank you. Mr. Reitinger. Just to support what Mr. Anderson said, I, I, I don't see a reason not to say violations of law will be reported to the appropriate law enforcement authorities because there could be city law, there could be state law, there could be federal law. I don't know that we need to specify. If you break the law, we'll report it. All right. So does anybody have any concerns with the language proposed by Mr. Reitinger? All right. So seeing none. Okay. We'll remove um, the word state on line 34. All right, any other comments or thoughts on this policy? All right, seeing none. All right, there are four policies now that all relate to student transportation. We have a current policy 4.44 called student transportation that actually covers a lot more than just student transportation. So the way this is structured by the VSBA, there are four model policies that would replace this one current policy. 
and again, many thanks to Ms. Michael going through this policy, making sure that we get this up to date for our new transportation director upon um, Ms. Hendrickson's retirement. The first policy that would replace a part of policy 4.44 is policy EEA, Student Transportation Services. Any questions about this policy? Dr. Anderson. Not a question per se, but mostly a comment um, and just wondering if there's a way to, um, uh, I don't know, fix this. On lines eight through 11, um, I'm just going to say I had to read that sentence multiple times to, to wade through the order of the subclauses. Um, I just don't know if there's a way to, to rearrange the wording that it has the same meaning. Um, I think what the part that is the hardest to deal with is uh, clear written procedures governing how transportation, and I'm going to just put this in brackets, will be provided, arranged, and, and funded for the duration of time. Um, it just, you know, it's just long. I, I know what it's saying. I don't, just don't know if there's a way of making the language a little clearer. Um, I don't actually have a suggestion. It's just um, a concern that came to mind. One proposal would be to say um, the superintendent collaborates with local school services agencies to develop and implement clear written procedures governing how transportation will be provided, arranged, comma, and funded for the duration of children's time in foster care in order to remain, um, to maintain their school of origin when in their best interest. Uh, that would be, in my mind, much simpler, much clearer language. Okay. Thank you. Does that sound good to folks? Okay, I will um, bring that back for second reading and I'll have to go back and listen to what I said. That's good. Any other questions on policy EEA? All right, the next policy that would replace a portion of policy 4.44 is policy EEAB school bus scheduling and routing. Any questions about this proposed policy? The next transportation related policy is EEAC school bus safety program. Um, other than changing from transportation director to director of trans supervisor to director of transportation, um, this is word for word included in policy 4.44, so certainly would not change um, our current practices. Questions about EEAC? No. Then the last of the four policies that would replace 4.44 is EEAD, special use of school buses. Any questions about EEAD? Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Chair Lynn. Uh, not a question about the policy so much as um, how common has the application of 4.44 been in the past? How often do we have our uh, our buses used for these sorts of activities um, outside of the normal uh, regular hours and normal uh, extracurricular activities? So we regularly use our buses to transport students from our extended daycare program. Um, so whether we're moving them from one school to another or in the summer, taking them on field trips, and then also through our collaboration with the general government, we often use our buses to transport students that are involved in the Rec and Parks summer camp programs, or even during the school year, our students that are attending their program on Wednesday afternoons when we have early release, we're transporting those students to the community center to participate in that program. So those are our two common uses for our buses outside of our regular school activities. Thank you. All right, those were the four policies that would replace 4.44. Um, there are two other policies, 8.70 and 8.73 that relate to bus drivers and transportation. And the model policy that encompasses those is policy GDQ, school bus drivers. Um, this is a fairly extensive policy. It aligns in many ways. GDQ aligns in many ways with current policy 8.70 and 8.73. Um, thanks to Ms. Michael for working through this. I also will be working um, with Ms. Hendrickson and her 
um, replacement to update our corresponding regulation. Right now it's 8.70R and there's a corresponding form 8.70F. Um, so we would update those and update our bus driver handbook, hopefully between now and when we come to second reading with this policy next month, um, so that we have an updated GDQ, a regulation GDQR and a form GDQF. So they all align with this policy. And then of course we would make sure that our bus driver handbook aligns with the updated policy. Any questions about model policy GDQ school bus drivers? Chair Lurton. Vice Chair Downs. Thank you. Uh, and this is a question, this is sort of out there and I'm not sure, um, but I'll just throw it out there. Uh, the, um, on lines 77 through 79, when we talk about drivers are prohibiting, prohibited from using illegal drugs, how does, um, and this is where I look to you as a lawyer, um, I know last year a medical cannabis was approved by the state. Does that have anything to do with, I mean, we don't, we don't put it in there. I don't even know. I, I just like throw it out there. Is that, is that considered an illegal drug? Do we have to, if someone says I have a medical issue, I'm approved to have, that? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. That's a good question. I'm and, not. And the reason that I giggled is because we were talking about that oh, okay. as part of this. <laughs> we've, we've all been talking about I just about didn't it. know like, if someone would does, say, how look, does this work look exactly? I have a doctor's note. Right, I can, right, right, I can pick, right. you know, and I, I don't even know what the law is I, on if you can drive when you're having, you know, I don't, I don't. Well, you'll notice actually under the model policy, the only prohibition under prohibited conduct is alcohol possession. So we did add um, illegal drugs on the job or detectable concentrations of illegal drugs in their bodies while on duty to make sure that we protect our students. But then talking about anything that might be subscribed, per prescribed by a doctor that would be covered under um, lines 86, 87, 88, 89, talking about um, no driver shall report on duty or may, uh, remain on duty when the driver uses a controlled sub substance ex except when the use is pursuant to instructions of a licensed medical practitioner who's familiar with the driver's medical history and has advised the driver that the substance doesn't adversely affect the ability to safely operate a commercial motor vehicle. So I do think that that would cover it. We also added then lines 83 to 85 saying no driver should report to duty if their abilities are impaired as a use of prescription or of over-the-counter medication or any other safety problems that could affect the welfare of children. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that does cover it. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions on policy GDQ? Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Chair Litton. Um, in that same block of text that we were just discussing on line 89, I am uh, a stray is that needs to be replaced with um, the appropriate uh, gender neutral language. Thank you very much. I did not catch that. I will do a word search of this whole policy to make sure I didn't miss that anywhere else. I tend to do that after every policy review, but if I missed that line, I might've missed it somewhere else in here. So thank you for pointing that out. In all honesty, that's exactly what I just did too was another search when I noticed that one. <laughs> it's the only one I could find. All right, thanks. Anything else on policy GDQ? Seeing none, the last policy for this evening is policy KN. We have a current policy KN titled sex offender registry notification and another policy KNA violent sex offenders on school property. The VSBA has done a complete overhaul of this policy as it relates to the sex offender registry and the ability of an individual to come on school campus or school grounds based on changes to the Virginia code. Um, part of that policy update was combining policies KN and KNA and changing the entirety of policy KNA, including the title to now be sex offender and crimes against minors registry information. So while the practice would really just be the same as it's been in the past, the whole language has changed um, based on updates to the Virginia code. Um, we do think based on the importance of this policy, it's important to get this before the board and get this one changed, even though it's kind of out of the, the normal course of the policies as we're working on them now. Any questions about this policy KN? Seeing none, that is the final policy presented for first reading this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Minson. Um, can I get a motion for approval of first reading of policies? Chair Litton, I move that the school board approve first reading of policies FB, facilities planning, 
ECA, Inventory and Reporting of Loss or Damage, KGB, Public Conduct on School Property, EEA, Student Transportation Services, EEAB, School Bus Scheduling and Routing, EEAC, School Bus Safety Program, EEAD, Special Use of School Buses, GDQ, School Bus Drivers, and KN, Sex Offender and Crimes Against Minors Registry Information. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Um, is there a second? Second. second. All right, I'll give that to Mr. Reidinger. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Yes, thank you. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolonos? Yes. Thank you, and the motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Goodell, and thank you again, Ms. Minson, for all your work on the policy. Thanks for keeping us going. All right, the next item is future agenda topics. Does anybody have a future agenda topic they would like to raise at this point? All right, oh, Ms. Dimmick, go ahead. Or oh, sorry, Dr. Dimmick. All right. Um this may well be in the works already. I'm, I guess I'm just curious uh, to learn more about our plans for instruction next year. I know that um, families were uh, sent out a survey whether they, or not they were going to do um, in person or virtual. And I guess I'm just concerned that um, we, that it would be hard. This has been a very hard year and it is, and I think it would, it, it, is hard to be all things to all people. And I guess um, I'm concerned about concurrent learning and the pressures that will put on staff and what that might um, change for classrooms if it sort of forces more kids to be on the computer than they would otherwise be if they were back in the, you know, back in the pre-pandemic classroom setting. So I, I, I would appreciate hearing more about that. So, so our plan was to give you an update in the Noonan's notes. Um, the numbers that we're seeing are in the single digits. And so it really is a, a small universe of students that have selected to uh, potentially be online. Um, we're also gonna reach out to those students individually and their parents before we actually make a final decision about the direction that they're gonna go. It's our, it's our hope to um, utilize any concurrent teaching as sparingly as possible. It would only be likely at the second grade or secondary level if there was any uh, at the elementary. We would likely, if we had enough students, uh, move to a, a virtual teacher, but I don't think at this point we have enough students to even do that. So um, what we're seeing is a great response to being back to school, but um, I'll be sure to update you. Great. Did, did you hear that? I just looked down and I think my mute. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Uh, Trilliton, can I just ask a follow up, Dr. Noon? Um, do you have a sense? Uh, and I don't, again, I, I don't know. Um, I know, I guess it's fourth grade and up, but that if um, peop those single digit students, those numbers would change if those students were fully vaccinated by the time school starts. Do we have any sense of that? I, it'd be speculation at yeah, this point. I, yeah, I, yeah. I would imagine, though, that it likely will have an impact. Could, could we ask them or not? We we can ask. When, I'm just I'm just, yeah. just throwing that out. There. It really yeah. is a small number yeah. of, of students, and right. I think the schools are reaching out to those students, but okay. we can we can certainly find out. Thank you. Great. All right. Seeing nothing else, we will move on to 10.01 superintendent's report. All right, a um, few things tonight. Uh, first is that um, May is both Jewish American um, Heritage Month and also Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And we've been celebrating these uh, with daily facts led by staff members at each of our schools um, and certainly led by many members of the high school staff. I hope you all have seen those. Wanna take a, a moment to thank the PTA for their leadership in putting out the teacher appreciation yard signs um, as I was weaving my way through the city last Sunday, um, they, were, they were cropping up like tulips um, in the springtime. It was really beautiful to see all those come up. And I can say that they had the impact that was desired. Our teachers uh, feel really supported and so do the staff. 
Um, the Family Resource Center is going to be offering free English classes to parents and adult family members of FCCPS students starting on May 18th. Uh, and so we have uh, continued to send that information out through Erica Siquera, um, who is our Family Resource Center liaison. Um, if you are interested in a Falls Church Education Foundation Cicada t-shirt, they are continuing to uh, sell those, but they recently raised over $4,000 for the Family Assistance Fund with the Cicada t-shirt, and we want to thank them, um, and they'll be selling them until the end of uh, the week, till May 14th. And congratulations to, and it was a hard-fought win, the Jesse Thackeray and Mount Daniel team uh, of the Hippo Tiger Giraffe Games this past weekend, and kudos to the elementary PTA for putting on a great event on Saturday, um, and all the staff who uh, participated. My, my, working, um, my, my working command was nobody can get hurt. <laughs> and nobody got hurt, and that was good. Um, so at JTP, um, just at, speaking of cicadas this week, some of the students at JTP had their very first sighting of cicadas, and it was very exciting for them. Um, so as much as some of us may not like them, our, our preschool students love it. And later this month, they are going to get a visit from the Public Works Department and the Volunteer Fire Department with trucks and, and equipment to explore. It's one of the, our favorite days at Jesse Thackeray. Uh, they bring the big trucks over and the kids get to get in them and, and hang out. Um, at Mount Daniel, last week, Farmer Sharon returned to Mount Daniel with eggs uh, for the incubators that are there. So this is an all-time favorite uh, kindergarten event. Some of you may have participated in. Um, but all the classes are learning about and seeing firsthand how eggs incubate and we're anxiously awaiting the hatching of the baby chicks on or around May 21st. So be on the lookout for those. And at TJ, um, we, we do want to again give kudos to the fifth grade um, students on their completion of their PYP exhibition projects. After working with their teachers and their mentors, all of the students presented their classes to their classes and to their fans. Um, and wanted to thank him for that. And also a shout out to Carrie Cheka, uh, who was uh, personally responsible for making sure that that went off without a hitch. At Henderson, uh, the first performance of the, in the new high school auditorium was held last night uh, and the choir uh, just wowed the, the assembly of proud parents. And we were excited to have another performance tonight. Unfortunately, we weren't able to go to, but the high school chorus and choir performed. Um, and we are very pleased to have them in our new auditorium. The counseling department held their first virtual career fair with video presentations from community members for students to watch and to learn from. And also our, our seniors, and I'm hoping um, our school board member senior participated in Elevate Day on May 3rd, recognizing the paths that they will take next year. Students and staff joined in to show how many directions are open to high school graduates by wearing t-shirts and tops from their favorite from their destinations for next year. And the traditional US map seniors can pin showing where they're headed is in the innovation commons. If any of you are on uh, campus and wanna see that. Um, Friday and Saturday, students are returning to the stage with the production of Songs for a New World by Jason Robert Brown, which showcases beautiful singing around a theme of decisions and junctures in life. There are limited live performance performance seats um, and it will stream for free. So be on the lookout for that. I actually will be in attendance on Saturday evening and I'm looking forward to that myself. Uh, plans are underway for the outdoor prom at school, uh, graduation at the stadium and the all night grad party, which is gonna be half the night, um, will take place at Clarendon's and the State Theater in the outdoor area in between the two. Um, and then the last is uh, this week wraps up all the Mustang Career Series chats. Um, this has been ongoing for the last two months, and we're grateful to a group of more than 40 professionals from a variety of careers, including Dr. Dimmick, including Ms. Minson, and including Ms. Kopic, who have done several virtual presentations for our students about their careers. So thank you all very much for that opportunity, and every student had a chance to participate, and we hope that they did. So a lot of things happening. It's a busy time of year as we make our way towards graduation. And uh, this is also a very exciting time um, during the year and look forward, to, uh, look forward to great events over the next several weeks. And congratulations to those of you that have seniors. Can I add something? Or three of them. Yes, sir. Um, next week on the 18th, um, is a program of community conversation put on by the Mary Riley Stiles Library on um, mainstreaming African-American uh, history into the curriculum. Um, 
I, myself, uh, Dr. Noonan, and chairman of the All Church Historical Commission, Ron Anzalone, will be uh, on that panel. And it'll be at uh, seven o'clock, I believe. And so I just wanted to throw that into the mix since we're talking about um, educational uh, programs. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, next we will move on to board and student liaison comments. So I will go ahead and go alphabetical order. So starting with Dr. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Luton. Um, my only report is to say I was uh, able to attend the uh, Chamber of Commerce board meeting this morning and um, we had a good conversation, um, presentations from, uh, from both uh, our colleagues on the city council about some of their work and that took up a, a chunk of it talking about the new noise ordinance and uh, some then on to discussions of some of the uh, renovations that are going to be going on and are ongoing in some cases for uh, many of the buildings around town so uh, there's going to be construction galore this summer so uh, not just in our area but up and down broad so everyone should be prepared for that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, Dr. Dimmick. The Special Education Advisory Committee enjoyed um, the presentation by Ms. Sharp of the annual plan, uh, which was great. Um, and they also completed work on their bylaws. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Vice Chair Downs. Thank you, Chair Litton. Uh, the Parks and Rec Board met uh, the other evening at the Fellows property, which is the um, vacant lot across from TJ Elementary. And um, several community members joined us. And uh, it was just to sort of walk the space. And um, there are certain trees that will not be removed. And trying to, at a, at a later date, um, the Parks and Rec Board will have sort of a town hall with neighbors um, to look at that property. But part of it is, uh, looking at having maybe some gardens and things that uh, TJ could use as an outdoor classroom. Thanks. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Uh, Mr. Henderson. I, I think you're muted. I probably could have saved what I uh, said before. And so I have nothing more to add. No worries. Thank you. Um, let's see, Mr. Reitinger. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Chair. Uh, I've attended a couple of meetings since the last. Uh, last week was a meeting of the Health and Wellness Committee. Um, although there had been an accident um, not involving a school person uh, on bike to school day, um, overall that was viewed as, the day was viewed as a very big success. Um, there was some concern and some interest that with the construction, we make sure that <clears throat> we're actually improving the ability to bike and walk to school. Um, and a suggestion that the bike and uh, walk to school maps that are created, interesting because we just revised the policies associated with that tonight, um, it's time to update them. So that might be a job for the, um, the new uh, transportation coordinator to uh, take up. Um, <clears throat> there was a question about can um, the construction be timed around to allow um, use of the trail for school commutes. That is not the school construction, but that the construction on the WNOD trail is uh, being disruptive for some people walking and biking to schools and wondering if it might be possible to um, to be able, certainly once next year starts, if the construction is still ongoing, to time that in some way so as to avoid uh, school commutes. Um, and there was also, uh, and I think the board will be hearing more about this from the chair, um, uh, a fair amount of concern expressed by the members of the health and wellness committee um, about the proposed cell tower. Um, certainly some health concerns, but some green, green space concerns and some eyesore concerns. So generally from a, from a health and wellness perspective, the committee was concerned about the installation of a new cell tower, which is under discussion by the board right now. Yesterday, I attended the DCAB meeting. 
um, some exciting things going on. <clears throat> One of the things the DCAB was interested in is, is it going to be possible next year to continue to do um, a good part of the meetings online? As you can imagine, the members of the DCAB are um, often working parents and the ability to meet virtually has really increased participation um, in the committee. And so it would be great if state law uh, or and school policy allowed them to to be able to continue to do that. The committee has three openings and they're hoping to, uh, to fill those. <clears throat> uh, just in terms of registration, um, the Mount Daniel is already full um, uh, for next year and has a wait list for the aftercare program. And there are only a few spots left in, uh, in the TJ program. Uh, the last thing is, um, that the program is fully staffed, like Dr. Noonan said before, for the summer, but there's gonna to need to be some hiring for the fall to make sure that um, everybody can be uh, accommodated. So that's my report, thank you. Um, Ms. Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. Thank you, Chair Linton. Um, so on behalf of the Falls Church Elementary PTA, they wanted to thank all the parents, teachers, and community members who made the ATG pos HTG games possible. Um, a big congratulations again to what Dr. Noonan said to Mount Daniel and to JTB for the games. Um, they said it was a huge success and a huge thank you also to Kristen Michael for being there and supporting um, them the whole entire day. As far as the athletic boosters, um, spring sports have started. It is their busiest time of the year. They have 16 teams traveling and competing. And right now, one of their main challenges is transportation and buses. Um, over the past two years, the athletic boosters have purchased about $10,000 in equipment for sports teams. And they're hoping to be able to protect that investment by finding storage um, for, their, for the equipment they've purchased. And this year they are, they are awarding $11,500 in scholarships to eight graduating seniors. Um, they added a new scholarship award this year, the Forever A Mustang Scholarship. And um, as mentioned before, they have the fall joint fundraiser with the Falls Church Education Foundation, um, a golf tournament uh, to benefit the Family Assistant Fund at the, and the Bill Rose Athlete Assistance Fund at the Westfields Golf Club in Clifton, Virginia. And that's on Wednesday, September 29th. And then the Coral Boosters, um, they had their first restaurant fundraiser. And they, to what Dr. Noonan was saying, they are helping support the theater department in the high school musical this weekend, um, Friday and Saturday. And they are also looking for a secretary replacement for their board. So if anyone knows of anyone with an interest or background in choral music and would like to join their board, they would be happy to welcome that person. And they have their first Zoom meeting next um, Wednesday, May 19th at seven. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Ruiz Polanos. And thank you to everybody. It sounds like everybody has been busy going to meetings during this busy time of year. So a big thank you to everyone. Um, on my list, I will just mention that I was able to attend the Northeast Regional School Boards meeting, um, which is a great chance to, to see some of our colleagues, school board colleagues in the region. Um, it was held on Zoom, but we were able to see they awarded all of the art contest winners. Um, and then they had a speaker on social and emotional learning. So it was great to be able to attend that. And then I will just, some other people mentioned this, but um, big shout out to the PTAs for all of their work um, with Teacher Appreciation Week and for the elementary PTA followed up by the Hippo Tiger Games all in one week. That's kind of amazing. That's a, <laughs> that's a heavy load. So um, big thanks to those guys. All right, we will move on to approval of the minutes. And thank you to Ms. Goodell for getting some more minutes done. 
And can I get a motion for approval of the minutes? Uh, Vice Chair Dance. Chair Litton, I move that the school board approve the minutes of October 27th, 2020, November 10th, 2020, and November 17th, 2020 as presented. Thank, Thank you, Vice Chair Dance. Uh, Mr. Henderson with the second. All right, Ms. Goodell. Yes. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Mr. Reitinger? Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Luis Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. Um, Next, I will just mention uh, materials for board review. We have the document on FCCPS enrollment. And with that, I, oh, uh, Mr. Anderson or Dr. Anderson, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Lynn. Um, I just Can we go back for just a minute to the um, to 11.01? .01 and uh, I, I'm not sure if Ms. Snyder had any comments to make, but I realized we, um, I, maybe I missed it. So I figured I should ask. No, you didn't. I apologize, Ms. Snyder. I apologize for missing you this time. <laughs> um, do you have anything you'd like okay. to? Um, thank you. So I think Dr. Noonan mentioned a lot of what I was going to say, um, but the school year is coming to a close, which is a little bit crazy, but it's a little bit nice too, because it's the end of um, a stressful, but also really, I don't know, hopeful year. Um, so we are planning prom and graduation outside. Um, and then the choir had their concert today. The band has a concert next week. And then of course the show is this weekend. Um, students are getting vaccinated and um, I think like still wearing masks in school and social distancing for the most part, which is great. Um, and the social justice committee is also working on a project to showcase like different aspects of all church history. And they're also working to put on a field day for all students on, I think, May 21st, which is also the last day of school for seniors. Um, so a lot of important work being done, um, even as the school year comes to a close. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Snyder, and congratulations as you wrap up your senior year. We're excited for you, but it sounds like there's a lot going on. Um, so thanks again. All right. With that, we will now move to our second closed meeting of the evening. Um, and can I get a motion to move to closed? Dr. Anderson. Chair Lytton, I move that pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose to discuss or consider the identified subject matter Personnel under section 2.2-3711A1, in particular, superintendent's contract and evaluation, and personnel under section 2.2-3711A1, in particular, assignment of chief officer legal services. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Ms. Goodell. Uh, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. So Great. here's the, functionally, this is probably the easiest way for it to work. If, if you both will log into this meeting, um, I'll turn over the host to you, and then we'll all skedaddle. And then just turn the light lights off when you leave. <laughs> and and I'm gonna this will this will remain on. Um, I'm gonna.